next. Forget all that is not suffering, and tune your mind to understand the pleasure of pain. A quote from the umbral leaves. Zonguthon, also known as the Midnight Lord, God of Darkness, Envy, Loss, and Pain. His alignment is lawful evil, with domains including darkness, death, destruction, evil, and law. His favored weapon is the spiked chain, and centers of worship include Belkzin, Chiliax, Geb, Irizen, Nidal, Varisia. Of course, his nation is considered alien. Zonkuthon is a twisted, cruel, jealous god who defiles flesh to bring pain and misery. He represents ever-present pain, emotional darkness, consuming envy, and debilitating loss. Unrepentantly evil, he finds only brief joy in the pain he causes others. His very existence is a corruption and parasite upon the world. His alien mind constantly seeks new ways to oppress, humiliate, demoralize, and destroy others. While his true goals are incomprehensible, his stated desire is to flay every living thing until the entire world is an intertwined mass of bleeding flesh writhing in pain-racked ecstasy. He whips the minds of serial killers, guides the hands of torturers, and plays the nerves of the suffering like a master bard. Zonkuthon offers no great wisdoms, no promises of universal truth, no guarantee of rewards in the afterlife. His strange mind sees little difference between this life and the next, and he tortures living flesh and dead souls alike with hideous pleasure and delicious pain. It is possible that this bleak nihilism may be part of some more elaborate master plan, incomprehensible to even his greatest priests. But so far, the method and message is that his existence itself is pain. His faith is lawful, following the natural hierarchy of the strong preying upon the weak, whether for food, entertainment, sex, or proof of dominance. Zonkuthon's direct intervention in the lives of mortals is usually brief and ambiguous, with the price often outweighing the benefit. A slave under the whip, who prays for relief, might experience sexual pleasure, but find the pain is heightened. A craftsman who seeks perfection in his work achieves it only after obsession drives away all his loves. A count who prays for help against invading orcs may gain the help of a cruel warlord who takes over the orc lands as his own and becomes an even greater menace. Despite these hidden poisons, depraved and despairing mortals continue to pray to Zon Kuthan for help. He has countless minions devoted to listening for these requests, watchful for those who might be tempted by the dark prince's umbral embrace. Zon Kuthan's true appearance varies and there is no consistent depiction of him, but the overall image is easily recognizable. His flesh is pale and bloodless, usually hairless, though he sometimes has wispy blonde hair on his scalp. Contrasting with the pale skin are bloody red wounds, many of which are held open with hooks, straps, and splints, some appearing partially healed and reopened. Sometimes his skin is completely gone in places, revealing bare muscle or even bone. He frequently has piercings, sometimes through muscle and bone, with bits of jewelry or remnants of his victims dangling from them. Even his face doesn't escape this attention, with spikes and hooked straps pulling into a strange configuration, his lips removed to show bloody teeth one eye removed and replaced with a strange crystal or the entire back of his head gone, revealing skull and brains. He is usually shown wearing a vertical metal crown, 
that pulls his flesh back into an obscene sunburst halo. Parts of his body that lack wounds are usually covered in blood-stained black leather, often sexualized, or used to manipulate the wounds in an obscene manner. Absent this orchestra of mutilation, Zonkuthon might appear human, but glimpses of his unaltered parts set the maimings into sharp, horrifying contrast. Mortal representations of him are usually simplified to a pale man in black with one significant wound. Different cults of the church may venerate one version of his image over others, going so far as to duplicate that image in their flesh, but these cosmetic differences are irrelevant in the faith's pursuit of pain and darkness. Zonkuthon's favorite weapon is a spiked chain, a versatile tool both in battle and in the deepest dungeon, and as a result his symbol is a skull with a spiked chain threaded through the eye sockets. Most of his priests are clerics, but there are several orders of corrupted paladins who inflict pain in his name, and certain primitive tribes worship him under the tutelage of adepts. In Nidal, where the church of Zonkuthon is the state religion, the clergy are often shadow callers, government agents raised in the worship of Zonkuthon since childhood and trained to use both arcane and divine magic in his service. Zonkuthon is called the Midnight Lord and the Dark Prince. His most recognizable servants are Irines, Chitons, and Hellcats, comprised of unfathomable darkness. While Zonkuthon's faith is one of small, secret cells and cults in most places, there is one area in Golarion where the opposite is true. In the nation of Nidal, the catastrophe of Earthfall caused widespread famine and death as the world suffered under a thousand years of darkness. Rather than die off, Nidal's terrified human populace dedicated itself to the Midnight Lord in exchange for survival. Today the Church of Zonkuthon is as established and Byzantine in that nation as those of lawful gods in other societies, and integrally tied to the government, with imposing cathedrals in population centers like Pangolias and Nisroch. Perhaps the most recognizable agents of the faith, shadow callers trained in the infamous Dusk Hall of Pangolias, are chosen as children via magic items called night glasses, then trained into elite weapons which the umbral court can use to keep order within the nation, or loan to Chiliax as part of the Midnight Guard. The god's horrid affection attracts evil sadists, demented masochists, and those whose spirits are so wounded that only overwhelming pain distracts them from their sorrows. When prisoners left to starve in obulets cut their own flesh just to remind themselves that they exist, the dark prince is there. Jilted lovers who make sick plans to avenge themselves or plot petty cruelties for their unfaithful mate feel his touch upon their souls. Every mother that starves herself because of her dead child, every cult that requires an initiation of pain as proof of sincerity, every teamster who lashes his animals harder to work them faster, all are watched by Zan Kuthon's gouged eye. Fighters turn to Zan Kuthon to help manage their pain in the midst of battle and battlefield healers, fascinated by vivisection, use the god's power to save lives at the cost of their patient's agony. Monks and rogues study vital spots that let them incapacitate opponents silently with intense pain. Assassins learn the most painful, non-lethal poisons in order to send a strong message to political rivals. Slave masters learn how to motivate slaves to their maximum output with proper use of the lash. Constables and inquisitors use torture to extract information and confessions, though it's rarely wise for them to advertise it. Zonkuthon's faith plays a role in the lives of all.
all these people. Services to Zon Kuthan always involve torture, whether performed on slaves, prisoners, or willing members of the cult. The more exquisite the agony, the greater the offering to the Midnight Lord, and particularly skilled torturers can keep a victim just shy of passing out for days at a time using magic or drugs to keep themselves awake for these extended prayer sessions. Clever members choose a poetic torture for members of rival faiths, such as putting golden splints under the nails of Apadaran priests, hatching moth larvae on the eyes of Desmond wanderers, and affixing red-hot iron shoes to the feet of Torag smiths, called the Dance of Death. Larger temples may have a scream choir of alchemically or surgically altered slaves who can only sing or scream a single note when played by a torturer conductor. Many cult rituals involve the blurring of pleasure and pain and encourage dangerous or humiliating sex, whether with other cult members or unwilling parties. Necrophilia is not frowned on, but it is not common, as the undead do not feel pain in the same way the living do. Zonkuthan's church has no overarching organizational tenets. Each cell or temple has an understood hierarchy based on physical or magical power, ingenuity, willingness, and ability to endure pain, and similar elements related to the church practices. Rather than standard duels, rivals within the church often engage in rites of escalating, self-inflicted injuries, until one party concedes, can no longer perform, or perishes. These contests also escalate the status of the participants in the eyes of witnesses. There is usually little reason for different congregations to cooperate, as the church rarely has large-scale goals requiring united effort. Rather, the Church of Zan Kuthan seeks to fuel a single tide of horror and bloodshed, content to lap at the edges of society, breaking off pieces and slowly weakening it. In the church, a superior priest is generally called master or mistress and equal and inferiors are addressed by name without title, though in places like Nidal where the church is prevalent, additional titles such as over diocesan are more common. Zonkuthan's temples look more like torture chambers, and many are actual torture chambers converted for church use. Any typical instrument of torture is a fixture, and spluttering torches or dim, smoky candles are the norm for illumination. When worshippers are secretly using a site for rituals, they either bring a representation of the Dark Prince as a centerpiece, often a preserved corpse dressed as the god, or a victim to ritualistically disfigure into such as an icon, or pray to an empty iron maiden as a representation of his presence. If the church controls the place outright, it has more permanent decorations, such as obscene mosaics that both represent and inflict pain, perhaps with living creatures bound into grotesque taboos. In smaller locales, the church might be a secret cave or basement where the cultists meet, littered with surgical or torture instruments that can reasonably pass as form tools or craftsman tools in case the lair is discovered. Given the specialized interests of the cult, there are few remote shrines, though a place where someone was deliberately brutalized might attract the attention of a Cuthite, even for justified violence, like burning an evil necromancer at the stake. The faithful may leave offerings at these sites, such as a few drops of blood, an animal skull, a bit of sharpened metal, and so on, until the place gains a subtle atmosphere of suffering and evil. Aside from rare church-based duties, clerics of the Dark Prince have a single goal, bringing pain to the world. In the absence of moral or immoral guidance from their patron, most choose their own paths and use Zonkuthon's gifts to serve their own desires. Their deity is largely indifferent to mortal affairs, but still grants spells in response to the proper prayers. 
Many clerics of Zonkuthansi power without responsibility and aren't particularly zealous. In other words, being a priest is a secondary calling to them, leaving them most of their time to focus on their obsession with conquest, wealth, magical power, and so on. Some join the church because they tire of the conventional delights of the decadent lifestyle and seek the thrill of darker indulgences. Those who zealously join the church are usually mad or damaged individuals with a history of torturing animals. Such unbalanced sadists tend to rise to the higher ranks of the Kuthite church because of their innate lust and desire for pain. Because the church's use of torture relies on suffering as a measure of devotion, most clerics have a good understanding about the body and how to heal it or hurt it. They can withstand torture for hours without screaming, though they might do so just for the glory of it, and are experts in preserving life in the face of mortal injury. In remote areas or places where magic is scarce, a Kuthite, cleric or otherwise, might gain a reputation as a skilled surgeon, though his gleeful leer as he performs his services without mind for the patient's pain can be unnerving. With their access to divine magic and mundane skills, a Kuthite is a miracle worker on the battlefield, though his patients might regret the attention. A Kuthite priest living in secret in a community might feel protective toward the people of it, seeing them as his toys and brutally retaliating against those who threaten them. For example, if bandits attack a village, the resident Kuthite might hunt down the bandit leader, torture him to death, and leave his body parts as grisly trophies in a circle surrounding the bandit camp. In places where the darker side of society is tolerated, Kuthites might act more openly and gain a measure of reluctant acceptance. Much as undertakers perform a necessary function that most choose not to think about, representatives of the Dark Prince's more socially acceptable aspects occasionally appear in civilized areas and might even work significant good, but even these congregations are merely fronts meant to lead the weak toward the true excruciating majesty of Zonkuthon. Aside from the faith's crusade of pain, high-ranking members of the Church of Zonkuthon occasionally set their subordinates to specific goals. Murdering individuals whose death is sure to cause widespread grieving, the recovery of artifacts holy to Zonkuthon, or that the Dark Prince merely desires, and the provocation of wars and other calamities are not beyond the opportunistic Church's plotting. Fallen paladins that serve Zonkuthon usually do so as the result of continuous torture at the hands of talented priests. It is a rare few that become disillusioned with good on their own and slowly take the heavy-footed path to damnation. Breaking a paladin with torture is a long process, and many such victims manage to call upon a spark of divine power to martyr themselves rather than abandon their faith. Those who survive and fall gain a twisted sort of devotion to their tormentor, a sick, fawning sort of love that is the antithesis of chivalrous devotion. Those priests within the church who manage to turn paladins are highly respected, and thus low-ranking Kuthites dream of breaking a holy warrior despite the low success rate. In Nidal, where paladins of Zon Kuthon are most common, Many keep an interest in what they call their dark lineage. This stems from three sources. What god they served before joining the army of the Midnight Lord. What paladin order they joined, if any. And which torturer turned them from their former path. The more connections two fallen paladins share, the greater their sense of kinship. There is no animosity between the various levels of lineage though in conflicts a fallen paladin tends to side with one whose lineage is closest. Some people have been scarred by things they have seen, or by the things that have been done to them. They lose the ability to feel, or they feel too deeply, and find release through physical affliction to the flesh. Others are simply sociopaths and madmen, full of hatred for the world as they see it, or else decadent monsters with a penchant for cruelty fetishes. Whatever their motivation, those who choose Zonkuthon as their deity are empty of pity and empathy. They are utterly amoral and merciless. 
The followers of Zonkuthan are called Kuthites, and outside the faith the word is usually followed by spat curses, or spoken in frightened whispers, for the followers of the Midnight Lord, pleasure and pain are two sides of the same glorious coin, and they seek to enrich themselves and others by granting both freely. The church has no official formal garb, though most priests dress in fetishistic versions of the god's own garments. Body modification and self-mutilation are the norm, and in some cases these experiments are so extreme that worshippers' flesh interweaves with their clothing to the point that removing it can kill them. Members of the church quickly learn how to keep wounds clean and free from infection, as well as how to conceal them from the public eye. Those whose alterations are severe and cannot pass as normal often disguise themselves as lepers or monstrous half-breeds. Particularly skilled and clever members of the cult have been known to skin their victims, tan them into supple leather, and wear the skin as a disgusting garment over their own wounds. Many of the church's flesh artists are known for their ability to preserve facial skin so that it can be worn like a mask, allowing wearers to pass inconspicuously for short periods of time even under close scrutiny. Zan Kuthan's holy book is umbral leaves, and is usually bound in and made of flayed human skin. It contains all known fragments of lore and prophecy spoken by the god's prophets. The words are scratched into the surface of the leather and stained with blood to make them readable, rather than being painted or inked into a flat surface. Older copies may have notes trying to interpret some of the more ambiguous phrases. The collection of quotes is extremely disjointed, and no two copies have the exact same order, sorting them by date, topic, or seemingly at random. Though the ravings of madmen, these comments tell the god's story from his own perspective, speaking of the exhilarating knowledge he discovered beyond the stars. Zonkuthan's church has few holidays, but regular meetings usually take place on the night of the new moon. The joy-making. One bizarre cult belief is that the less flesh a person has, the more concentrated the sensation of pain and pleasure is in that remaining flesh. Surprisingly, a legless man experiences greater pain and pleasure than one who has two good legs. Privileged members of the church can arrange to have their limbs amputated and all unnecessary flesh removed, eyes, ears, tongue, lips, and so on, leaving only a writhing head and torso that must be fed and cleaned by others. These joyful things are the most envied of the faith, as their entire existence is devoted to limbless pain and pleasure. They are normally kept in secure places belonging to the church where any member of the faith can torture and violate them. The joy-making holiday has no set date or frequency. A member of the cult who has enough privilege and wealth to deserve and afford this attention may call for the joy-making ceremony at any point. All available members of the congregation then eagerly convene to assist in the removal of the honored members, limbs, and non-essentials in sections over the course of one night. Often the removed pieces are eaten by the others present in hopes of gaining an echo of the joyful thing's luck and sensation. The Eternal Kiss This holiday takes place on the first moon of the year. A victim is chosen, usually an enemy of the church, but sometimes a favored member of the cult, and pampered luxuriously for a period of eleven days with exotic comforts, fine food, erotic companionship, and so on. The eleventh night's attention begins as normal, then suddenly shifts to physical and emotional torture using whatever creative methods the cultists can devise from fire to blades to poison to drowning to countless others. 
the cultists use magic to keep the victim alive as long as possible, often pulling the victim's entrails out and using them for divination, called anthropomancy, looking for signs of Zonkathon's will. Very rarely, the suffering victim speaks in tongues, conveying phrases in other languages that can be pieced together into a prophecy. In the face of their master's endless darkness, Zonkuthon's worshippers gird themselves with simple affirmations of hopelessness. Abandon your tears. In a cult that worships pain, tears are evidence of weakness. When tortured victims cry, it shows they have not embraced their pain and thus are unenlightened. When cultists are tortured, they love their pain and refuse to shed tears, focusing their energy on savoring the whole broad, bloody line between agony and ecstasy. This aphorism is an admonition to the victim and advice to the faithful. Experience without limits. This phrase has two meanings. It indicates that the cult seeks physical sensation beyond the normal limitations of mortals, mixing pleasure and pain to reach an experience on a new level. It also means that a Kuthite should not let the rules of normal society dictate limitations on her goals and desires. If she wants to taste her sister's blood or open her neighbor's chest to kiss the beating heart, so be it. There is an unspoken acknowledgment that everyone has this right, and thus the aggressor may later become the victim. For it is only natural that the strong dominate the weak. Ages ago, Zan Kuthan was Du Brawl, half brother to Shalin. Little is known of his original powers or the extent of their relationship, but at some point they argued, and Du Brawl abandoned Golarion for the far dark places between the plains. Shaylin grieved for her lost brother, but was more horrified by his return. The church of Shaylin contends that before he left, the siblings shared custody with what is now her portfolio. Yet during his travels in the void, some unfathomable entity found and possessed the young god, driving his original self into a tiny prison within his own existence. This alien presence filled the void of Du Brawl's godly power with twisted versions of the things he used to watch over and protect. Beauty became mutilation, love became misery, music became screams, and the art of creation became the craft of torture. When Shaylin reached out to her lost brother, he pierced her hand with his black nails. Again the siblings quarreled, and he responded with violence to her tears and pleading. Only after she wrested Dubral's weapon, a golden glaive, away from Zan Kuthan, did they reach a tenuous peace of silence and avoidance. For countless centuries, Shaylin has tried to find ways to make her brother remember who he is, all with little effect. Zan Kuthan acknowledges that he and Shaylin were once siblings, but has nothing else to say on the matter. Today, Zonkuthon has little to do with other deific entities. He has no desire to create allegiances, no need to wage war, and no interest in playing diplomat between rival powers. Although he aided in the imprisonment of Rovagug in youth as Dubral, this was his last cooperation with his peers. The only deity seemingly safe from Zonkuthon's sick intentions is his half-sister Shaylin, though her followers have no special protection from him and his, and she limits her contact to brief visits in person with powerful defensive magic at the ready. Zonkuthon's evil nature and vile practices make him a target for good-minded faiths, though he is as likely to ignore attacks on his minions as to retaliate. From time to time, agents of Asmodeus strike deals with his lieutenants, especially in Nidal, in which the Kuthite government acts as a vassal of hell-aligned Cheliacs. Yet, while the Diabolists may see this as proof of the Archfiend's superiority, most Kuthites believe the Dark Prince is simply biding time and laying a trap. 
The hordes of Lamashtu also engage in buying and selling knowledge and slaves with the Midnight Lord's faithful, but their interactions are always at arm's length because of his people's propensity to experiment on their allies. His faithful see those who follow other gods as insects and scoff at their pitiful attempts to prove their lives have more meaning and purpose. While their lord may refrain from attempting to harm Shailin, his followers see no need to extend that courtesy to her faithful, and may especially enjoy creating canvases from the stretched skin of the eternal rose's worshippers. Warped and corrupted by his presence, Zonkuthan's prison realm of Zovaikane was supposed to last for all time, sealing him deep within the plain of shadow and isolating him from the rest of creation, much as the dead vault does for Rovagud. Yet when Earthfall cast Valorian into an age of darkness, a technicality within the god's binding ended his imprisonment, allowing him to re-enter the world. Rather than abandon his prison, however, Zonkuthan displayed his returned power, by remaining in it. Today, the God of Darkness's domain extends as a region of complete and utter blackness, seen from the outside like a great obsidian wall rising from the ground and piercing the clouds above, dominating the Shadow Plains landscape for miles. While no light violates its borders, the same cannot be said of the screams, as a hellish, wailing cacophony endlessly issues forth from the domain. Rarely, one of the god's petitioners bursts free as well, usually panicked and covered in lacerations, only to scream even more as his momentary and likely orchestrated freedom ends with the gloom extending out like an arm of a great black kraken wrapping around him and dragging him back to his torment. Virtually nothing is known of the domain's interior, even by the god's followers, as with exceedingly rare exceptions, only Zonkuthan's deific servitors enter and exit the domain. In addition to Zonkuthan's servitor race, the Lampadarians, the following outsiders serve the Midnight Lord and eagerly answer planar ally spells and similar calling spells from the faithful. Dominic the Unquenchable a human vampire. Once a rapacious Kuthite lieutenant, Dominic fell prey to a vampire and rose as an undead predator. Members of his own church captured and tortured him. He is a handsome, middle-aged man with stark blonde hair, prominent canines, and long, elegant hands lacking fingernails. His entire abdomen is ripped open and empty, a wound his formidable regeneration has strangely never healed. When he drinks blood, it drains just as quickly out of his wounds. As a result, he is constantly ravenous and is prone to falling upon helpless foes to drink them dry. If conjured, he appreciates creatures he can feed on, large supplies of blood, or magic that can temporarily sate his hunger. He is a lawful evil human vampire. The Prince in Chains this horrid amalgam of exposed flesh and writhing chains, shaped like a wolf, serves as Zonkuthan's herald. Originally the noble spirit wolf who, according to legend, sired Dubral, the Prince of Chains, has been reduced to a travesty of his former self by the attentions of the Midnight Lord. Once noble, the Prince of Chains seems only to revel in pain, its infliction and its receipt and sees it as a fundamental truth of life's very existence. It delights in the pain experienced by sentient beings more so than the sufferings of dumb animals, but is not above torturing and slaying a beloved pet or animal companion for the nourishing reward of anguish caused to its owner. The Prince of Chains wanders the depths of the Plain of Shadow and patrols the lightless steel labyrinths of Zyvokain, seeking others with whom to share his emphasis on pain.
If summoned to the material plane by a servant of Zonkuthon, the Prince of Chains enjoys being given human flesh to consume after a bit of playful torture. Kuthite clerics view a wound bestowed by the Prince of Chains as a near unparalleled blessing, though few can hope to survive such an honor. Rit Hall, a unique Kaiton evangelist. Also known as the fiend whose wounds are like wounds, this creature is an unnaturally tall and lithe Kaiton evangelist whose weapons continually abrade and slice its own flesh to reveal half-formed eyes, wagging tails, and cysts that drop living maggots. This elf-like thing never touches the ground with its feet, wrapping itself tightly from the calf down so that its pallid flesh never touches bare earth or stone. Vrit Hall speaks through a permanent wound in its throat. It has a fondness for wines, exotic drinks, and living slaves. Nobody knows its gender, and it may have surgically removed any evidence long ago. That was some dark stuff, but we finished Zon Kuthon. Our next deity will be the final one in the Core 20, so why not end with a bang, with the god of nature himself, or herself, or itself, whichever it is. Up next is Gazra, the wind and the waves. Stay tuned, and as always, have a great day. God bless, and enjoy. This content was made possible by travelers and viewers like you. Thank you.